down at Charleston Farmhouse over the last year, uh, two young internees have been uh, cataloging the latest uh, collection, well, the folder, uh, which is just labeled Lincoln, I think, in Duncan Grant's handwriting, which has come through to Charleston uh, through the um, legacy of Angelica Garnet, Duncan Grant's daughter. Um, and so there's still more to be seen of the immaculate preparations that he made uh, for the murals here. The murals have always been, to me, a little bit of a puzzle. How did they come? How did the commission come to Lincoln? And then why, having arrived and made such an impact on that little chapel, did the chapel then get neglected, abused even, over so many years? until fortunately we had an enlightened clerk of works. It always depends who is working in the cathedral and when. For example, you could have a dean like Dean Dunlop who commissioned with his chapter the murals, who obviously must have supported it, the murals, uh, passed on to another dean who might have had a violent reaction with his team. And, and, and that's why neglect happens. There are Philistines among the clergy as among all of us. <laughs> um, um, Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce, who uh, collected uh, Duncan Grant uh, paintings, they've got a lovely collection in the Red House uh, at Aldborough. Uh, they obviously came to Lincoln sometime in the early 60s because in a letter to uh, Benjamin Britten, one of his friends writes, I'm very pleased that you and Ben, oh, this is obviously to Peter Pears. I'm very pleased that you and Ben liked the chapel at Lincoln. I've never met anyone who's seen it. And I think that would have been the same. I came to work at the cathedral as a guide. Uh, I was lecturing at Bishop Grestest uh, University, well, it was college then. And uh, I trained as a guide. I knew nothing about the chapel. There was a red curtain across the grill. The door was always locked. And when occasionally one got a glimpse in because the door was open, it just seemed to be um, a store cupboard. There were cupboards against the walls. Against the walls, two cupboards. Um, and the altar frontal, which obviously had been chosen specially for the chapel, my guess is that Vanessa Bell chose the very simple altar throw. Um, that had been just bundled up into a cupboard somewhere. Fortunately, it had been kept. After I took early retirement, I had a, a, a post at the cathedral of the, its first visitor officer. It was a very um, interesting job because I had an almost completely free hand um, to choose what I should do. And we had a chaplain, a woman chaplain, who insisted that one of the chapels was used as a meeting place for people who perhaps were in distress or wanted to know more about Christianity. And uh, so the chapter was persuaded to clear out the chapel and put a false floor in with a nylon carpet on it, introduce a color gas heater and a little uh, electric heater to uh, cook, you know, to boil up a kettle and put in comfortable chairs. And it was at that point that I was able to have much more access to the chapel. Um, it puzzled me. It still slightly puzzles me. I do agree with Pevsner who writing in the buildings of Lincolnshire in the late 50s called it naive. Um, and I knew nothing really about Charleston and the Bloomsbury group. I'd read some Virginia Woolf. I don't know how many of you, where you came into learning about this extraordinary group of people reading Michael Holroyd's biography of Lytton Strachey was the great eye-opener for many of us. Um, and so it came to a moment when damage occurred, like a knife streak across two of the panels. Um, they had stretched, they had been pulled. And the clerk of works, John Bailey, who himself an architect and an artist, uh, had obviously had been into the chapel and knew quite a lot about it. 
he immediately saw to the clearing of the chapel and he got the best person in England who just finished working at conserving the walls and the furniture at Charleston Farmhouse prior to it being opened, the home of the, the Bloomsbury's in Sussex, um, opened to the public for the first time. She'd been working there. She came and did a test piece on the blue skirt of uh, one of the women you'll see on the wall. And it was amazing how the color came up. And so in the winter of 1990, early 1990, her team arrived, up went the scaffolding. It cost 5,000 pounds, 4,000 pounds more than Duncan Grant had been paid for the murals in the first place. Dean Dunlop, who commissioned them back in 1952, must have opened his times one day over his marmalade and coffee and seen an advertisement from the Edwin Austin Abbey Trust Fund for mural paintings in public places, including churches. A new fund just set up by the widow of this Edwin Austin Abbey, uh, an American mural painter who'd settled in England. It still exists, and I think, Lof, have you uh, benefited by it at all? Yes, yeah. You yeah. have, haven't you? That's lovely. Um, so aspiring artists or mural painters apply for a grant. And um, it said, commissions are invited. Now, Dean Dunlop, as a young man, had been chaplain to Bishop Bell of Chichester, uh, the pacifist bishop who uh, had encouraged the artists uh, at Charleston to paint the entire interior of the little church near their home, the church at Berwick. That was done in the 1940s during the war. So it wasn't so long after, 1952, but bare seven years, say, seven, eight years since, he must have known of those murals, and perhaps he thought, our cathedral needs brightening up after the war. This was just before the commissioning of the windows to in the Airman's Chapel, the first of the new windows by Harry Stammers, which Jim will talk about. And so it was that huge discussions as to who should be commissioned, but the commission was accepted. Now, had Stanley Spencer been the painter chosen by the trustees, I think we would have had a different history. But he was too busy at the time and Duncan Grant, who, um, in Jeanette Winterson's words, because she wrote the um, review in The Times when Duncan Grant's biography came out in 1997, it took nearly 20 years for a biography of Duncan Grant to appear, but it's a fine one by Frances Spaulding. And um, she wrote, critical and Commercial evaluation of Duncan Grant's work fluctuated during his long life.